Super Mario Maker managed to survive the Wii U somehow to become a hit franchise for Nintendo, and there's actually a very good reason why. Super Mario Maker 2 is the biggest launch of the year so far in the UK, where it sat on top of the charts for three weeks running, as well as being number one at launch in Japan, where it sold 196,153 units in its first week. How do they know to that specificity? God bless you. Japanese people, you love your numbers. Anyway, official US sales numbers haven't been released yet, and we won't know Maker 2's full potential for a couple of years. But we're inside gaming, goddammit. We're not gonna let a lack of concrete information set us back or hitting a 10 minute runtime on YouTube. Watch to the end, everybody. Get through all those minerals. We can sort of get an idea of how well Mario Maker 2 is performing with some clever extrapolation. In about the year following Mario Maker's 1 release, Nintendo announced over 7 million levels had been created. That's pretty cool and all. It's because someone turned on their Wii U, but. Super Mario Maker 2 accumulated 2 million levels in just 11 days. So it's safe to assume that an awful lot more people are actually playing this game than played the first. It's not uncommon for a sequel to outperform its predecessor, right? We see it all the time. Just look at T2 Judgment Day or Aliens or Piranha 2 The Spawning. Movies that were all very really directed by James Cameron, yes really. For some context, as of last March, the original Super Mario Maker on the Wii U sold 4 million copies since its 2015 launch, plus an additional 2 million plus on the 3DS. That's not bad, especially on the Wii U, a console that only sold roughly 13 million units in its lifetime. Most of those probably fell off a truck somewhere. Oh, oh Wii U. Of course, a game on a better selling console is going to sell better. That's just a given, and Nintendo did confirm on March 31st, 2019, that the Nintendo Switch had sold nearly 35 million units in two years. But that's exactly what I wanted to talk about today, with you. Yes, you, Jeremy. You thought you could hide, but I tracked you down and we're gonna have a little chat, you and I, about Mario Maker. So a lot of Mario Maker's 2 success can be attributed to the quality of the game, of course. It's been reviewed stupendously, raking in the 9s and 10s with an aggregate score of 88 on Metacritic as of this writing. I played a decent amount of it and it's everything there is to love about Mario's platforming mixed in with one of the most accessible amateur game design toolkits available. Now I don't need to tell you what a powerful combination that is, especially in the hands of a branding mastermind like Nintendo. But the most significant part of Mario Maker 2's success is in the hands of its fans. Also the hearts of its fans, right here. A mainline first party Nintendo game is always going to sell well. But the Mario Maker phenomenon has exploded beyond its humble beginnings because the Super Mario Maker series may very well be the perfect streaming games. At least when it comes to turning a loyal audience into cold, hard capital. Cash, that Twitch box, just cram it in my mouth and eat it. Streaming and Let's Plays are powerful forces in a saturated gaming market where every company is vying for a limited amount of players. EA reportedly paid Ninja a cool million bucks to stream Apex Legends between Red Bull sponsorships and Family Guy impressions, and rightfully so. For a brief moment, Apex eclipsed the juggernaut that is Fortnite. When a game gets traction on Twitch or YouTube, it can spread like chinch bugs through a cornfield, which had to look up what that meant. I promise it's not racist. But if you spend enough time on these sites, you know that the brightest flames burn quickest, with fads coming and going at a bonkers rate. Also, mega celebrities saying racial slurs and then getting banned but unbanned because if you're too big, you can't get banned forever. Anyway, so the fact that a relatively middling Nintendo game, at least sales-wise, was able to stay relevant for so long and so effectively is an impressive feat. There's something going on there, right? So let's find out what it is. There are plenty of franchises that were hamstrung by shoddy consoles and miscalculated launches that will probably never see again. Uh, I'm not gonna hold my breath for Rise 2 Son of Son of Rome, which I'm fine with that, but I'm also not expecting a sequel to Sunset Overdrive either after its abysmal sales performance, which is a shame because that game rules. It's on Steam now, please go play it. So ignoring the fact that Insomniac went on to make Spider-Man and has a really great thing going on now, would Sunset's future have looked different if the game had stuck around in the public consciousness like Mario Maker did? Maybe, I don't know. But the fact is, it didn't have that and now it isn't around anymore. Correlation isn't causation, blah, 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 yeah, okay, okay. But it's an interesting thought experiment, basically. What makes something stick and something else doesn't when it comes to YouTube media and Twitch media? So the audience generated by the first Mario Maker not only wanted to watch the content, but when the sequel released, they showed up in droves to actually buy the game. So why is that? Well, we have some theories. Uh, first is we'd like to see our experiences represented in the media we consume. There's value in seeing your experiences reflected in film and television and feeling a connection to them. For instance, I love Gone Girl because it speaks to me as a person who has framed Ben Affleck for murder. Didn't stick, maybe one of these times, and I swear to God, Jeremy, one misstep and you are next. Watch that movie at least three times, I know how to do it. Test me, Jeremy.
Games, of course, are uniquely positioned to make shared experiences widely accessible, and even when we're just watching them be played, it helps to allow for some form of participation, whether it's just vicarious or if you've been there. If you watch somebody play Souls games, you know, you get that, get that excitement when you see somebody else go through a boss fight you've already played, you know? There's a lot to be said for being able to jump in and experience what the personality or the streamer is playing, especially under the same conditions. Games like Fortnite, CSGO, and MOBAs, those are instances, specific circumstances that those players are in that you can watch. I can go and play those games, but it's not gonna be the same experience. There are just too many variables between random item drops and, yeah, 99 other random people that all have varying skill levels, you know. There are a lot of factors that play into those games too, like performative skill and big moments of tension release, but we'll get to those later. For me, a game like Hitman is a great game to both watch and own. The same clockwork begins at the top of every map with the same NPCs fulfilling the same objectives on the same schedule. So if I watch a YouTuber or a Twitch streamer or a Mixer streamer, <laughs> shit, I'm sorry, okay. So if I watch a YouTuber or a Twitch streamer or a Mixer, <laughs> uh, okay, if I, <laughs> oh yeah, well, we'll just have to, we'll have to skip it. Relax, Jeremy, don't, don't look at me like that. It's Microsoft, we're punching up, they'll be fine. So when I watch someone, playing Hitman and they pick up a coconut and knock someone's lights out, I can expect to hop into my own version of the game, find that very same coconut, and obliterate the exact same person in the very same spot. That one-to-one -one give and take improves both watching and playing, at least for me. I played enough of the game to know the level design, so when I watch someone else play the game, I have insight into why they're making the decisions they're making. Hitman maybe didn't have the same staying power or explosive popularity as Super Mario Maker, but 2018's Hitman 2 did outsell the first game, with Steam Spy estimating between two to five million copies sold, as opposed to 2016's Hitman selling one to two million. Of course, Hitman is an established franchise with an existing following, but if those numbers are accurate, that is a very significant improvement. Now that could be chalked up to a change in publishers or the return to a non-episodic release, but speaking from personal experience, I was really excited for Hitman 2 in large part because of how much I'd watched the first one. The industry recognizes what an asset this can be, demonstrated most obviously by two features of Google Stadia. The first being crowd play, which allows viewers to join in games with streamers directly, which serves to deepen the connections between a personality and their audience. But it's the second feature, state share, that veers much closer to what Mario Maker touches on very directly. It's essentially just a built-in tool to share safe states, which, you know, it's simple. It could do wonders for the relationship between streaming and play. Now, whether Stadia will be the landscape redefining experience Google says and hopes it will be, well, remains to be seen, you know, latency is no joke. But I do hope that other platforms take note of features like these. And Mario Maker's levels have always been super shareable, which contributes to its success. Of course, just because you have access to any given level doesn't mean you'll actually be able to complete it, because Mario Maker has gained the reputation of sometimes being extremely difficult. Turns out when you give fans the tool to create whatever they want, a lot of them will just immediately design a torture machine in the process. Kind of weird, it says a lot about people. Who knew that so many people would dare to hurt their fellow gamer? For shame, we're all in this together, guys. But we don't have to play them, thanks to the win. Yeah, the vast majority of Mario Maker content I watch involves particularly difficult levels that I wouldn't go near with a 10-foot pole. The satisfaction of watching somebody incredibly skilled take on a monumental challenge is something we all share. It's like watching the Olympics or your one friend that can eat 16 jumbo marshmallows at once. Don't even try it, Jeremy. Spit out that marshmallow right now. The sight of you may fill me with a deep and inexplicable rage, but I promised your mother I'd keep an eye on you while she's in Aruba. God bless her soul. She deserves a break, Jeremy. <sighs> Getting over it with Bennett Foddy is one of the more recent titles in a long line of games just designed to piss you off or piss a streamer off while you laugh and experience that schadenfreude. Severe difficulty goes far beyond conventional skill and hand-eye coordination and a voiceover perfectly made to frustrate you beyond your wildest dreams combined to make a truly maddening experience. And like many before it, getting over it is a lot of fun to watch, especially when the person playing it isn't doing so hot. With Mario Maker specifically, the joy of watching someone achieve something most players would never even attempt precedes Mario Maker, 
It goes back to Kaizo Mario World, or as it's more lovingly known, Asshole Mario. It's a series of ROM hacks of Super Mario World, and oh my god, they are unspeakably hard. It wasn't even the first hack to do so, but it captured the public's attention in a special way, which Mario Maker 2 has tapped into and bizarrely legitimized. Surely the developers of Mario Maker are familiar with these super hard ROM hacks, and whether they intended to or not, they've made that sort of game design more accessible than ever, which is an accomplishment. Not only are difficult levels the backbone of Super Mario Maker, but that difficulty can shift and change to meet entertainment trends. And it's Mario Maker's ability to adapt in that way that solidifies its position as maybe the best game to stream or watch. In most streams, there's a point of tension release. It's said we'd get to it eventually. Whether that's a victory royale or a death in a long Dark Souls run, it doesn't matter. It's when the pressure has risen so far and the audience interest has reached such a peak that when a moment of catharsis arrives, it provides a jumping off point for the viewers. Like, I wanted to stay until blank happened. Blank happened, so now I have to go to sleep or go to work or take a shower or get Jeremy to stop eating dirt in the front yard. Yeah, I saw that, Jeremy. Anyway. You can sort of apply that to a game's longevity in the public eye. Over a game's lifespan, its following will eventually dwindle, and though it's much less explosive than a chicken dinner, a game's popularity will slowly run out of steam. You know, it's not a, a perfect analogy, really, but it is an okay segue. As we get further from Super Mario Maker 2's release date, we're gonna see the Mario Maker fever cool and the fanbase condense into the writer dies. That happens with every game, right? You eventually just settle down into the people who are just happy to be there forever. However, Mario Maker 2 is uniquely positioned to retain a significant share of its audience as a result of its course creator. Many developers have tried to crack the nut of user-generated content, from Doom's Snap Map feature, to Far Cry 5's arcade mode, to even Fortnite in its playground mode, and, and those are fine, but they didn't exactly catch fire, probably because they're secondary to the main games, or at least the perception is that they're secondary. Through a magical concoction of familiarity, friendly design tools, and a rabid player base clamoring for more Mario levels all the time, Nintendo created a practically self-sustaining source of content. Not as an add-on, but as the product itself. And that's really impressive. Almost like GTA Online, a little bit. And somehow without monetization? God bless them. And not only is there a steady stream of levels coming from the community, but the game can shift and bend to navigate the trends in streaming and entertainment. If audiences begin to tire of a certain game type, different levels, and alternate challenges, will likely begin to take hold, which we saw in the original game. We didn't have to dig very deep to connect these dots, but nonetheless, I'm still impressed with the momentum the first Super Mario Maker was able to generate, especially, again, being on the Wii U. It made for one of the most solid launch pads we've seen for a sequel in recent years, setting up Mario Maker 2 to continue that blend of participation, challenge, and community content. The question now is what kind of support will they provide? Mario Maker is finally on a successful console with no signs of slowing down, which is great. But also, there's now the matter of moderation on Nintendo's end. Hopefully they can handle the massive audience and level creation without deleting more popular levels without explanation. We will just have to wait and see. Jeremy, what are you doing? Wait. No, Jeremy, Jeremy, don't, don't go. Wait, what are you, what's, what's on? Come on, man, don't leave. Don't, where would you even go? Put your backpack down. Come on, we can talk about this. Jeremy, don't. Please don't leave. I promised your mom that. Oh, shit. Hey everyone, welcome back to Instagram for Tuesday! That's right, it's Tuesday. Nintendo Switches are breaking, and not because people are snapping them in half while they're putting themselves to the torture. It is community-made levels in Super Mario Maker 2. It is literal torture. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's actually something that's been around for a significant while, but until now, Nintendo has actually never acknowledged it. Yeah, even though anytime they announce new Joy-Con colors, people always complain about this one thing all over their social media.